Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News on 3FM. My name is Beatrice Edu. The news is also live on Kazmi 107.1 FM and across the world at 3news.com. Coming up in the next 30 minutes. Electoral Commission opt for an offline registration system following 48 hours of exercise being marred by technical challenges. We ask, is this the right way to go? Also, NPP flag bearer Dr. Mahmoud Baumia promises a free education for persons with disability nearly eight years after his party promised same. And much later, we look back at 2023, uh, 23 years since the bloody May 9 stadium disaster and ask what is the GFA doing to save the sport from such events. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, the ongoing limited voter registration exercise is expected to improve across the country as the Electoral Commission has opted for an offline system. The EC has, in the last days, uh, in the last two days, used the online module, which has presented a lot of challenges. Internet connectivity challenge, late arrival of registration materials, power outages, and among others. Uh, well, the EC is going offline. Let's uh, take you to the grounds and speak to uh, George Quinnin, who is monitoring events uh, for us. George, uh, if you can hear me, what can you report from there? Hello, George. Hello, George. British, I can hear you. Excellent. Can what, hear you, what can you report from where you are? Okay, British. Okay, so it's actually day three of the limited voter registration exercise. And like you all know, two days, the past two days, I've been reported with lots of challenges, internet challenges, power outages here and there. And so really mad the smoothness of the exercise. And in, in light of that, the, you know, Electoral Commission directed district officers to switch to the offline mode of registration. That's exactly what is taking place right now. From today to, I don't know, to when, uh, the offline process is ongoing and it's relatively calm. No chaotic things have been experienced here. And some of the EC officials tell me that it's quite the best, but they don't have the, uh, the power to say that, oh, let's go with this for, for the total three weeks. It, it behoves on duty bearers to ensure that this is possible, but they cannot say that, yes, they have the right vo the voice to say, let's go with it. But they, ca they can constantly tell me that it's very smooth in offline mode speeches. Thank you very much, uh, George Quainin, uh, reporting live for yeah. us. Uh, he is in Accra. Uh, I'm joined by Christopher Amwako. He joins us from the northern region. Uh, Christopher, what's the situation where you are? Yes, so uh, currently, as we speak, uh, the registration exercise, though, is still ongoing, but there are still some technical challenges here in the Mango constituency where I am. Hello, Beatrice. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, yeah, so uh, there are still technical challenges uh, as we speak now. But uh, one issue has to do with some confusion between uh, some supporters of the MPP and the NDC, uh, which nearly marred the uh, exercise. But uh, the uh, West Gunja Municipal Security Council has um, cautioned uh, residents in the Damango constituency who uh, would want to do certain things uh, that will not go well with the peace and security of the area, especially relying on this particular election uh, 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 registration exercise. Uh, we all know that uh, for the past eight years, the Damango Township has not uh, witnessed some level of peace because of some chief tenancy issues. And so uh, re uh, MUSEC is warning that anyone whose actions through uh, this registration exercise can uh, uh, affect the peace of the area, the police, must go with the person. Christopher, before you go, uh, we'll bring the, the MCE sound uh, shortly, as soon as we do have it, but I'm wondering whether there have been any reactions uh, from the people there uh, beyond what you've told us. Uh, Beatrice, can you come again? I can hardly hear you. I was asking of reactions from people there beyond what you've told us to uh, this. Yes, I mean, the people, this is day three. People are not happy. 
the people are not happy with the incident that happened because uh, there are allegations that uh, the former member of parliament for the area, uh, Adam Mutawakilu, uh, visited one of the registration centres and did not uh, was not happy with the uh, electoral officers and the conduct of security personnel. So he complained and uh, it resulted in some uh, misunderstanding. And so uh, residents are saying that this is an exercise, uh, a national exercise, and Damango should not be seen as a, a violent area uh, for this exercise. All right, thank you very much, uh, Christopher Mwako, reporting live from the northern region. And we'll be bringing you updates as and when we do have them. Now, as the limit, uh, limited registration continues in its third day, Majority Leader Apanyo Marking is urging the Electoral Commission to activate its backup system to deal with the numerous challenges that have affected the smooth registration of uh, firm timers. The first timers, the first two days of the exercise has left many unregistered over the network issues and power outages. Let's hear what Apanyo Marking said exactly. The Electoral Commission must um, improve on its uh, system of registration. Obviously, if we are all talking about network failures, uh, then I'm not sure that they'll be able to complete on schedule. The frustrations, the delays must be addressed. So I'm urging the Electoral Commission to ensure that they have a backup system. Uh, we are told that previously, they used to have a system where even when the network was down, they had an offline system which was readily available for registration so that when the system comes up, it picks immediately. I'm told that the new system is a bit cumbersome. So if they can work uh, at it and ensure that they have an effective offline system which would allow for registration even when the network is down, it will help because as it is, the frustrations are one too many. And I would encourage the Electoral Commission to uh, live up to expectation to identify these challenges and leave them in the back. Thank you very much. And here the Majority Leader Alexander Apanyomarkin will be bringing you analysis on this very shortly. But ahead of that, let's head for the Ashanti region where Ibrahim Abubakar has been monitoring situations for us. He joins us live on the line as well. Ibrahim, what can you tell us? Where have you been first of all? Well, um, I've been to um, several centers. Um, at Kwarimam Point is um, registration center. Um, Subin, Ishiae, Sobantima, Menshia, North and South. Um, this morning... Um, the process is ongoing. Um, they are using, because they said the network is back, but um, they've made provision to go offline, like directed by their headquarters that should the network jam at a point in time, they will have to resort to online so that they will be able to um, serve the people who are coming there. At Karaskore Mampon yesterday, uh, we said they are hoping to serve around 250 but um, around 1 p.m., we were told that the network um, was not um, functioning properly, so it jammed the entire process. So they ended up the entire day serving only 98 of these applicants. This time around, they said they will have to go offline so that at least their target of um, serving not less than 250 a day um, will be met. Ibrahim, the first day when we spoke to you, as in on day one of the exercise, you told us that despite the challenges uh, the prospective registrants were facing, uh, they were bent on registering, kind of they had the appetite to still stay until things worked out. Uh, is that the same energy you get today? Well, um, so you get to the centers and you find a lot more people in queues. Um, possibly because um, the political parties have decided to pass these cases. Now they move from community to community, acts of people who are 18 and above who have not registered, then they will provide means of transport for them. Even though it is contrary to the ECs and directives, and the political parties are saying they are also stakeholders in this entire um, registration process, and they also have that duty to ensure that whoever turns 18 or more and is a citizen of Ghana gets the voter ID card. In fact, they believe that it is even um, the 
the EC should rather encourage them to do so because the EC itself wants to see more people coming to their various offices to register. So they move with their vehicles um, to the communities and make sure they transport these kids to the various voting centers. When they are done, then they take them back to their various homes. So uh, maybe that's how come we are still seeing large numbers at the various registration centers. All right, thank you very much, Ibrahim Abubakar, for bringing us that report from the Ashanti region. Uh, let's speak to uh, Dr. Rashid Tanko Computer. He is Deputy Director of Elections and IT for the position NDC. Good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, my dear. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you for asking. Let me first get your expertise, though, since you're with the IT. What's your understanding of this offline mode the EC is, is, has decided to uh, 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 use because of the technical challenges and the implications you, you see with that? Uh, well, it, uh, that is the two method that the EC has been using all along in registering uh, would-be registrants. They use the offline and then the online. The online is, is the network connectivity that allows them, when you register, go straight to the national database, okay, because it's connected. But the offline, that one they are after, it, it's not connected to any network. It's just like your own laptop. You sit in your room and type people's name into the distance. So when you finish, you have to take pen drive and offload it into a pen drive. Then it is not sent into... Uh, the electoral commission office and then offload it onto the national database. So that's just the difference. Uh, so that is what they are doing. So if you have network challenge, then you go to the offline mode. But this one, the DVRs are such that uh, you can only go offline when you are given a particular code. They have a code that they can give to you that will enable you to go offline. Okay, so that is the challenge. Unfortunately, they asked them to go offline. Most of the area, they didn't give them the code. So they are finding it difficult to migrate from the on, or online to offline. That is the challenge we are having with them currently. Oh. Although they've asked that the people should go offline. But most of the areas, they are finding it difficult to even go offline because they have not been given the code. And the code, some, some of the code they've given them are wrong codes. They are not correct codes, so they can't even migrate. When they are inputting, it's not working. Okay. That's the challenge we have with them now. Mm, we'll get your reaction on all the challenges uh, shortly, but just let's stay a bit on the technicality. So if I understand you correctly, there's nothing like um, any data going to be compromised. This is still good enough uh, as, as long as this can be transmitted to the national database. Now, the, the, the challenge here is that any crooked person can compromise the process. So when you, because it's offline, you input it in there. You have to put them and to offload it into a pen drive. Now, in offloading, and somebody add another data into it. You might not know. At the time you are taking the data, you might not know what the person is offloading onto the national database. That is where the, the problem is. And it, it is susceptible to all manner of crooked behavior. And because it's just offline. It's, it's just a normal typing of names and entering them into the, into the software, after which you have to offload all that you have done into a pen drive and given to the registration assistant or the registration supervisor, and he will now go to the registration uh, the, where the database is connected and, 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 and input them there. That is where our problem is. So at the time of offloading, it, we will want to be there so that we will see what type of data is offloaded. If it's the same data, we all agree at the registration center at the end of the day. You don't believe? And if we, yes, and if, we don't, if we are not there and we are just going to do it like we give the pen drive to them, they should go and offload it. So since, you're, your, yes, are good at since you're, you're experiencing these challenges and obviously expressing these concerns, is the NDC, for instance, going to have a dialogue with the EC on being present or a representative of political parties being present at the time you're offloading uh, the data to the national system? Of course, we are going to take it up with them, and then uh, we've asked our agents to strengthen their monitoring rule at the at the point of registry. Uh, so that if they take the data as uh, they have it there from the point of registration, uh, we can also collect what they have put together, and that one can help us monitor what they are going to upload onto the national database. Because if a, a, a district register say a day two hundred, uh, okay, and then we know that this district has registered two hundred people uh, a day. And then we know that that is, we are expecting 200 to offload it into the national database. If you want to offload 210, we are not going to agree. That's what we, we are trying to do, so that we make sure that we are, both of us are on the same page.
Thank you very much. Uh, we'll have to end it here. Deputy Director of Elections and IT for the opposition, NDC. Uh, thank you for uh, giving us your expertise, I, I, uh, ideas, as well as uh, the NDC's reaction to this uh, challenge being faced by the Electoral Commission in the ongoing uh, limited voter registration exercise. Now, the President's refusal to release the full KPMG audit report on the revenue mobilization agreement between the Ghana Revenue Authority and Strategic Mobilization Ghana Limited continues to receive backlash. Investigative journalist Manasa Azuri Awene, whose outfit, the Fourth Estate, uh, work led to the revelation in response, wrote on X, uh, formerly Twitter, uh, the SML deal stinks. If they think hiding the KPMG report will make us forget the SML scandal, they should think again. The SML scandal will not die. And those behind it in the past and in the future will face justice no matter how long it takes. So that was a post by Manas Azirawene on his X page, executive director of the foundation. Uh, the uh, Suleiman Abraham says the posture of the presidency is disturbing. It's a clear indication of the fact that the president doesn't want to be transparent as far as the whole uh, GRA SML brouhaha is concerned. Of course, uh, right from the beginning, some of us were of the view that this massive, you know, scandalous deal couldn't have happened without the president being aware, given that uh, at some point it involved the minister for finance himself directly. I'm talking about the president's cousin, Tenno Foriata. And so um, while writing to the president, um, I, I felt that, well, given that the president touts his credentials when it comes to um, the passage of the RTI law, mm. his office would be the uh, foremost office to respect the fundamental principles as uh, provided in the in the act. Mm. But um, perhaps um, I was wrong in that expectation because I think the president is basically trying to hide behind legalese in doing what is what is the, the, the need for because the sections that they, they indicated clearly um, wouldn't 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 apply and in the circumstances under which we requested for the full information uh, and I say so because you see I, I didn't write to the president on the basis that I have heard that KPMG has released the report to him. Mm. And so I need a copy of it. I only did so after the president had done all the, whatever deliberations had to be done, whatever discussions had to be done, and eventually made his decision on the report known to the public. So essentially what I am saying or what I requested from the president is now that you have finished with whatever you wanted to do with the report and made your decisions about it and communicated your decisions to the public, can I have the report on the basis of which you made your decision? Or the, the office of the president says, um, the report uh, uh, forms the basis of the deliberative processes of the president and so on and so forth. So the question is, is President Ekufuado going to be involved in the renegotiation of the contract as he has directed? And you heard the, the executive director of the Media Foundation for West Africa, uh, Suleiman Braima. For the United States-based uh, Ghanaian uh, professor, Kwekwasari, President Akofado was wrong in refusing to release the full report of the KPMG. He wrote on his Facebook page, quote, An audit report is a public record, not privileged advice to the president. KPMG is a fact finder, not a presidential advisor, unquote. Now, his comment uh, followed the decision by the Office of the President to deny Media Foundation for West Africa's request for the full KPMG audit report. As you heard, its executive director talking to us earlier. Now, the president uh, cited sections 51A and BI of the RTI Act, stressing that it has the right to reject requests for information deemed crucial. The Ghana Revenue Authority this month indicated that it had terminated a transaction audit and external verification service contract with Strategic Mobilization Ghana Limited SML in compliance with directive given by President Akofado. Adam Senano is co-chair Citizens Movement Against Corruption. He joins us live on the line. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Senano. Thank you so much. I know you've been holding off for some time. Thank you for joining us. 
Thank you for having me. Mm, I don't know whether you heard uh, the executive director of Media Foundation for West Africa <laughs> saying that he thinks that the president is hiding behind legalese to not to do what he's expected to do. And you've also heard Professor Kwekwasari uh, there uh, disagreeing with the president, uh, saying he was wrong in refusing to release the full report. I'm wondering whether you share the views of these individuals. Well, yes. I, I think uh, in promoting good governance, transparency and accountability is one of the key pillars. Um, and this is an issue that the public has been very interested in. Um, I think that the president can review his position on this matter. The report, if there are sensitive sections, those could be redacted. You just black out those. But in the whole, so that we know that the terms of reference was comprehensive, the logic behind the findings is generally there, the recommendations, if most of, I mean, what it is we have said is there. That gives us the opportunity to see that, yes, the, the, the president hasn't taken out anything and there are no political partisan interests being shielded. I think it's an important thing, uh, irrespective of what sections of the RTI may say, uh, just to bolster our confidence in what the president has put out. So I just want to read a bit of what the president uh, cited. The 5-1-A uh, and B-I of the RTI Act stressing that it has the right to reject requests for information deemed crucial. The 5-I says information is exempt from disclosure where the information A is prepared for submission or has been submitted to the president or vice president for consideration or B contains matters the disclosure of which would reveal information concerning opinion, advice, deliberation, recommendation, minutes, or consultation made or given to the president or the vice president and is likely to I undermine the deliberative process on the part of the president or vice or, or vice president or prejudice national security so that is I I you still would not agree with the president with this quote I have great difficulty in knowing or appreciating what about an investigation of an entity that is supposed to be doing good give a good work for Ghana. What would that report throw out that becomes uh, a national security emergency or a deliberative process that the public cannot know about? I mean, this is these are not supposed to be national security issues. In the first instance, these contracts would have been entered into through a public process which are competitive. It would have had to be scrutinized by Parliament, which is also open. I mean, I'm trying to point out that the public process competitive will be public. The uh, multi-year process signing would have to be at Parliament level. It would have been public. So at this stage, what the people of Ghana are saying is that give us the opportunity to test that our systems work or the field, and let's put in the remedies that ensure that this is not repeated in the future. So it's in the best interest of all of us that the president releases the report. If there are a few sentences here and there which they think have real national security implications, they can redact them, black them out. But I think that the presidency can review its position on this matter in the interest of, of promoting good governance in Ghana. Before you go, if I get your line of argument, you probably may be siding with those who think that the presidency has something to hide. The reason it's using legalese not to release the full report. Absolutely. When, when, when they choose not to release a report, it raises red flags. It makes it suspicious for all of us. What exactly is in this kind of report where the, the group itself ought to have gone through a public process and everything would have been known anyway? So what is it that they are finding that they don't want to put out in the public space? It raises more red flags and suspicions. And I think that just to, you know, um, calm down and make sure that nobody has some thinking that perhaps it's not even the case, they should just release a report if they have to redact portions. I think that's acceptable. Is there anything you would, that could be done to force the presidency to release this report from where you sit? I don't think the idea should ever be to force a president. I think that the president being uh, mindful that the political fortunes of his party depend on every action he takes, being mindful that uh, Article 1 1, Article 35 1, the sovereignty lies with the people who repose it in a president and a government for a period, will understand that he's an agent of us. Uh, and at all times, he must take into consideration how we feel about issues and respond accordingly. I think that that should be sufficient for a responsive president and presidency to know that something like this 
will be what will augur well for all of us and will carry us along. Respond accordingly. Thank you very much, Adam Senanu, co-chair, Citizens Movement Against Corruption. Now, prices of textbooks are likely to go up in the next few months, flowing the increasing cost of production. The Ghana National Association of Authors and Publishers fears that the current cost of doing business may collapse their businesses if no action is taken. The group has been addressing the media in Kumase, and Ibrahim Abubakar has been on the story as well. Uh, let's hear more from him. In recent time, macroeconomic indicators such as higher inflation, high interest rate, high exchange rate have called on us to take serious actions to remediate our industry from collapsing. Our industry, we need to let you know and stress that it governed around two principles one of which we will describe as local, and the other we will describe as foreign or international. What happens here is that Ghanaians want to produce high quality books. As a result, when we produce the books internally, copyrighted in our own names, we take these books abroad to get them printed. Once they are printed, we bring them back to the country take advantage of the Florence Agreement in 1950 to lower the cost of sales so that education will be free and affordable to all Ghanaians. What we are witnessing today is different because government, directly or indirectly, in its bid to avoid higher importation of books, has come up with several elements within the documents we have. This is a trade document. If you go to the port today to clear one 40 feature container, something that is already stated to us that no port duties because of Florence Agreement, you end up paying about 290,000 Ghana cities to clear booths for kindergarten, and you have uh, a representative of the Ghana National Association of Authors and Publishers uh, addressing the press earlier. Uh, Vice President uh, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia says that the government has accrued over 200 million CDs at revenue since 2020 when it rolled out its digital initiatives. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia says that the government will adopt a blockchain technology to continue to deal with corruption and block revenue leakages. Uh, he recounted how corruption has affected the African continent. Listen to him speak earlier. For example, by digitizing the passport application and revenue management processes, we not only doubled the number of passports being issued between 2018 and 2023, from 347,000 passports to 752,000. We also increase the revenue of the passport office by eightfold from 12 million Ghana cities to 94 million Ghana cities. Perhaps one of the most significant results of our digitalization agenda has been through the integration of the public sector databases using the Ghana card as a unique identifier through biometric audits, we have been able to see the removal of 29,000 ghost pensioners from our national pension scheme, the SNIT, and it is saving us 480 million Ghana cities annually and a further 44,707 ghost workers were eliminated from our national service scheme. You heard the Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, and that's how we end the news here on 3FM. My name is Beatrice Edu. Thank you very much for joining us today. Log on to 3news.com for more news. Good afternoon.
Hello, good afternoon. This is Business Daily on 3FM 92.7. Coming up, Ghana Revenue Authority provides clarity on electronic VAT implementation, expressing optimism of its significant impact. We'll bring you details. But also, experts make case for sustainable mining practices, urging government commitment to restore Kalamse devastated forest reserves. I think in this day and age, especially because of the media, if you do not get community relations right, I don't think you've got a sustainable project. Plus, Imani Center for Policy and Education calls for change in government programs and interventions to favor small and medium-sized enterprises. Because we don't create much more supportive environment for the SMEs, they are unable to also scale up and support some of the work that we are doing in, in, in climate change. My name is Menu Afo. Details of these stories and more are lined up for you. Do stay with me. Thank you for your time. In our first story, the Ghana Revenue Authority, GRA, has addressed concerns raised in a recent publication about the electronic VAT system. The GRA has assured Ghanaians that the EVAT rollout is progressing smoothly through a phased approach. The following three business reports explains the process. We'll bring you details of that later on. But a mining expert is making an urgent call for sustainable mining practices in the country. Projects director of large-scale mining firm Better Land Ghana, David Thomas, bemoans the impact the menace is having on livelihoods of mining communities in the country. He was addressing the media here in Accra. Ghana, largely about nine in ten of non-household establishments are SMEs, but because we don't create much more supportive environment for the SMEs, they are unable to also scale up and support some of the work that we are doing in, in, in climate change. But this, most of the foreign direct investment that come, because they come with large-scale projects, they're able to get some direct support from GIPC and other agencies to facilitate something like tax exemptions. They're able to get sometimes, if they want to apply for some tax reliefs within our fiscal regime, they're able to do that because most of the um, f uh, space that, or some of the policies and the programs that we run typically tend to target large-scale investment. That's why the environment looks a bit more supportive for those who are doing large-scale investment in some of these green investments in Ghana. But for the small SMEs or the SMEs within the green space, because we've not really conceptualized them in policy making and identified their needs and how we can support them, they are unable to get those policy support because most of the policy support that are available typically target large-scale investments. Yeah. David Thomas is Projects Director of Large Scale Mining Firm Betterland Ghana. In more stories, Imani Center for Policy and Education is calling for policy conceptualization that favors local, small, and medium sized enterprises to help them benefit from government programs. Senior Research Fellow Dennis Asari, during a dialogue to facilitate the growth and development of local SMEs, especially those in climate smart businesses, bemoaned that current policies largely favor large scale investors. He believes local climate smart enterprises have great potential to help the country fight climate change if given the needed support and attention. Most of the businesses in Ghana, largely about 9 in 10 of non-household establishments are SMEs. But because we don't create much more supportive environment for the SMEs, they are unable to also scale up and support some of the work that we are doing in, in, in climate change. But this, most of the foreign direct investment that come, because they come with large-scale projects, they're able to get some direct support from GIPC and other agencies to facilitate something like tax exemptions. They're able to get sometimes, if they want to apply for some tax reliefs, within our fiscal regime, they're able to do that because most of the um, 
f uh, space that or some of the policies and the programs that we run typically tend to target large-scale investment. That's why the environment look a bit more supportive for those who are doing large-scale investment in some of these green investment in Ghana. But for the small SMEs or the SMEs within the green space, because we've not really conceptualized them in policy making and identified their needs and how we can support them, they are unable to get those policy support because most of the policy support that are available typically target large-scale investment. Yeah. Well, over there was the voice of Denis Asari, a senior research fellow at Imani Center for Policy and Education. Well, that brings us to the end of Business Daily here on 3FM 92.7. For more stories, kindly log on to our website on 3news.com. Before we go, our headlines, Ghana Revenue Authority provide clarity on electronic VAT implementation, expressing optimism of its significant impact. Experts makes case for sustainable mining practices, urging government's commitment to restore Kalamse devastated forest reserves. And Imani Center for Policy and Education calls for changing government programs and interventions to favor small and medium-sized enterprises. Kindly log on to our website on 3news.com for more business stories. I am Minu Afo. Do stay tuned. Urban Blend is up next.